Hello, everybody. My name is Kelly Higgins. I am the executive director for the Autism Community Connection. Um, ACC is a local nonprofit here in Johnson County, and we serve individuals and families affected by autism in Johnson County and the surrounding counties. We have a lot of enriching programs. Um, we have a young adult connection um, groups that meet once a month. We have a teen summer program. Um, we help fund counseling sessions and we provide uh, family um, support for anybody who's looking for information. And then we have a lot of social events, you know, throughout the year. Um, our next social event coming up is Breakfast with Santa um, on December 3rd. And uh, we are so excited today to have this wonderful webinar with Amy Corbin. Um, Amy, um, thank you for joining us today. Absolutely. Thank you, Kelly, for having me. My name is, and thank you, thank you for attending. Thank you to our, our viewers who um, are able to take the time to um, out of their day to view this um, in the future whenever um, it becomes available on your website. Just trying to get things going on my end. There we go. So my name is Amy Corbin, and I'm the executive director of the Indiana ABLE Authority. And that the ABLE, Indiana ABLE Authority is the state entity that oversees our state's ABLE savings program, which is called Invest ABLE Indiana. And so if you walking through, I'm going to provide a lot of information for you this evening. Um, and as we process through this, I just want you to remember a, you can always reach out to me or the plan. I will give you the contact information at the end of the webinar today. Um, so always reach out to me or the plan if you have any questions in the future, um, as well as um, the two sort of key benefits to what are ABLE accounts. And those are one, ABLE accounts allow for certain individuals with, with disabilities to save money and not risk losing their benefits. And that is a huge benefit or, or um, a pro to the program in and of itself. The second key benefit is that these accounts, ABLE accounts, all provide, they provide for tax-free growth and savings. So post-tax dollars fund the account and those dollars can grow and be withdrawn tax-free as long as they're spent on qualified expenses, which we will go into um, additional details later on in the presentation. But for those of you who are not familiar with ABLE and how it originated, I'll give you a brief history lesson, but nothing too intensive um, about how it came about. So back in 2014, a group of parents with um, children, their children specifically had Down syndrome and they wanted to be able to save for their children with Down syndrome in the same ways that they saved for their non, their children without disabilities. And in, in such as the 529 college savings account. So knowing that if they saved for their um, loved ones with disabilities, they could potentially affect any current or future benefits that they might receive or be receiving. So these parents started having coffee, coffee table conversations and um, trying to figure out how, how they could make it so that their loved ones, their children with disabilities could save and how they as parents could save for their children's futures without jeopardizing those benefits. Um, so I mentioned, well, ABLE actually stands for Achieving a Better Life Experience, and you might hear these referred to, ABLE accounts referred to as 529A accounts. Um, 529A just stands for an ABLE account, just um, another name for it. And 529A ABLE accounts were actually modeled off of the 529 college savings programs, even though there are significant um, um, differences between the two types of savings accounts. Um, but I mentioned earlier, ABLE accounts allow for that tax-free savings for certain individuals with disabilities to save money for those qualified expenses and not risk losing their public benefits. So um, it's an incredibly, ABLE accounts offer an incredible opportunity for a population that has so far for so long been told that they can't save money, they can't save over $2,000 do a Medicaid spend down, don't, don't save over $2,000, disinherit your children, don't um, leave them any money in an estate, that sort of thing, um, because you could jeopardize their benefits. Um, and ABLE seeks to help, help to remedy that. Um, I will mention ABLE accounts don't solve the entire conundrum of earning extra money um, while receiving benefits and saving extra money. ABLE accounts only protect resources. They do not protect income. So that's important to keep in mind. Um, 
but the, the money in these accounts and the distributions made from the account as long, again, as, they're, as long as they're used for qualified expenses are disregarded or given special treatment for determining benefits such as SSI, Medicaid, housing benefits, um, and SNAP benefits. And I will mention, um, I do get this question quite often about, well, I'm not receiving benefits or my child isn't presently receiving benefits. Um, we'll look into it in the future or what would the benefit for me or my loved one to, what, what benefit would there be in ha them having the account? Um, and that the answer to that specifically would be the tax-free savings and growth. Um, and if you know, you're a parent of a, a, a young child or a loved one with a disability or you yourself are an individual with a disability, um, specifically within our autism audience um, tonight, um, all of the individuals um, speaking specifically within our autism community would be eligible for an ABLE account. Um, and I will go into in a few moments, eligibility for the program, for the, the, the accounts. But it's as a parent of young, of young ones myself, it's never too early to start thinking of and saving for the future, even if it's just a little bit here and there. I know it's, it gets really expensive um, facing the daily costs of life and especially um, um, with where things are right now in the world, it's kind of hard to think much about saving for the future, but you'll see this is an easily affordable um, and accessible um, um, savings and investment program that um, I really hope that you, you learn a lot this evening and today and um, give it careful consideration. <clears throat> so a little bit of background with that being said, a little bit of background with how we came about having uh, Investable Indiana here in our state of Indiana is that we joined what's called the National ABLE Alliance, and this is a partnership with 18 states total, um, not, um, not 18 other states, but 18 states total to offer this program in a sort of a, an account, economies of scale approach so that we pool um, the funds saved in the account to, um, to make it so that we can offer a user or an expensive user-friendly program. With that being said, the funds saved and invested in Investable Indiana are exclusively held with uh, held within the state of Indiana. So um, it's sort of it's 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 different than a trust. It, um, able accounts are not the same as a trust, but that's just kind of like the option that that, that pooled um, um, partnership to um, to combine our resources in that in so far as that goes. Um, but anyhow, Investable Indiana launched at the end of July in 2017, so we actually just experienced our fifth anniversary. Um, we're seeing more and more individuals engage with the program. We have um, approaching, I think, uh, we have about approaching 1,500 accounts in the state right now um, with over 10 million in assets under management. Our average account balance is right around $8,000. So it's a far cry um, from saving $2,000 or being only able to save $2,000 without jeopardizing benefits. So we're thrilled to be able to offer this program in our state. So I mentioned eligibility and how um, specifically our audience of individuals with autism would be eligible for the program. And that is because the the onset of the disability must have occurred prior to the age of 26. Um, so even if um, an individual didn't receive, um, say the diagnosis of autism until later in life, until after the age of 26, I think we all know that, that autism would have existed prior to that age from birth. So, um, but considering other types of disabilities, the disability onset, not necessarily the diagnosis, but the onset must have been present before the age of 26. And the additional eligibility criteria is that they must be um, eligible or receiving um, SSI or SSDI based upon their disability or blindness, or they can self-certify that they have a similarly severe disability if they are not receiving SSI or SSDI. And I will mention, that an authorized individual can, um, the eligible individual can open the account on their own or an authorized individual can open the account on their behalf. And just um, recently, final treasury regulations allowed for an expanded hierarchy of types of authorized individuals um, to open and operate an ABLE account. And the hierarchy includes, um, and it is an order of priority because it is a hierarchy, 
But first, it would be, of course, the eligible individual would have first um, priority to open the account. And if they are not willing or able to, then someone with a power of attorney, a guardianship, a parent, a grandparent, a sibling, or even a re social security representative representative payee is at the bottom of the hierarchy that could open and manage the account on behalf of an eligible individual. Now under self-certification, um, I mentioned, so they have to have that age of onset of disability before the age of 26. And if they're not receiving SSI or SSDI, they can self-certify. So self-certification essentially looks like um, having, having blindness as defined by the Social Security Act or um, a medically determinable physical or mental impairment with marked and severe functional limitation that is lasted or expected to last at least a year or result in the individual's death. And you must be able to, or must have this information, um, this diagnosis rather in writing and signed by a physician. It, um, the, the law that enacted um, um, ABLE accounts does require that it be a physician's diagnosis, so not another type of diagnostician, such as um, a mental health provider. So if it was a mental health provider, uh, a non-physician, then um, I would encourage some sort of collaboration or communication between that, diag that diagnostician and um, the, a physician. And the individual um, or the authorized individual on behalf of the eligible individual must be able to recertify annually and maintain that written disability related diagnosis. So our annual recertification process isn't anything like that of the benefits programs that you may or may, you or your loved one may or may not be receiving. I mean, it's simply, our annual recertification is simply an annual communication that is sent typically within um, a statement, an account statement that says by continuing to have open your investable account, you um, are certifying that you continue to be eligible for it. So it's no, there's no um, documentation that has to be sent in. And to that point, even if an individual is self-certifying um, when opening their investable account, they do not have to upload that diagnosis. Um, that is personal protected health information, and it is a just what it says, it is a self-certification, so you don't have to upload that diagnosis during enrollment. All right, so I mentioned qualified disability expenses, um, that those funds, the money contributed into and saved um, in the Investable account must be spent on qualified disability expenses. Um, so what exactly are there? What exactly are those? Um, and I will the, the list on your screen, and I'll, I'll go through as many of those as possible for any individual who might have a sight impairment who might be watching this, um, but they are basic living expenses, education, health and wellness, housing, transportation, legal fees, financial management, employment training and support. So say if someone is um, accessing voc vocational rehabilitation services and there's something that can't be fully um, funded for or provided by that service, by that resource, then the ABLE account could help step in and pay for that, such as clothing for a job interview or a new job, that sort of thing. Assist, assistive technology, other personal support services, whatever those might be, such as a, a in-home health aid, that sort of thing. Um, oversight and monitoring. So if an individual um, just needed additional assistance in over, overseeing certain um, life life matters or expenses in their life, that sort of thing. Um, and that was a fee for service that the ABLE account could step in and help pay for that. Even funeral and burial expenses are qualified expenses from the ABLE account. So that first one that I mentioned, basic living expenses um, is really broad, obviously, and um, rather um, widely encompassing of, of what um, types of expenses individuals might, I mean, all of these things are rather, rather broad and encompassing of the, the various aspects of life and, and expenses of life that might come up. Um, the best way to summarize qualified expenses from an ABLE account is that the expense must somehow be re related to the individual, the account owner, um, living with their disability, and that expense must improve their health, independence, or quality of life. So, and I will also mention that the expense does not have to be for the sole use of the account owner. So say we have a young adult that 
I don't know, an individual or um, one of our loved ones with autism that would like to buy a gaming system from, and we have seen account owners do this before. Um, I will, with the legal disclaimer, say that I'm not authorized to give tax or legal advice as it relates to qualified expenses, but I can give anecdotal evidence and, and circumstances, um, examples that I've come across um, in my past six years. I've been doing this for six years now, prior to the, the launch of this program. Um, so, so we have an individual who their, their social interaction is through maybe gaming or an Xbox or um, playing computer games, that sort of thing. And they wanted to use their investable account to pay for that. That is possible. We have seen account owners do that. Um, they just need to be able, um, they or their um, authorized individual just need to be able to, if, if the account was ever audited, they need to be able to certify under penalty of perjury that that expense was for a qualified expense, that distribution was for a qualified expense. Um, transportation is a big one um, because Medicaid typically doesn't cover all the costs associated with that. We see a lot of individuals um, maybe using their ABLE account to offset um, other types of um, therapies that may not be covered under their current um, benefits or insurance. Um, housing related costs are qualified expenses. I will mention in regards to housing costs that um, say, so down pay, we see individuals using their investable accounts to save up for a down payment on a home or other independent living expenses. And so say you're sa saving for your, your young child and you would like to, and, you, and one day they might be able to live on their own and, and have their own apartment or even um, move into their own home with a roommate, without a roommate, that sort of thing, you can start saving and setting aside money for them now to hopefully maybe have a down payment on a home one day or educational expenses. But specifically in regards um, to those housing costs, those funds withdrawn from the Investable account, if they are going to be used to pay for housing related costs, um, then the money has to be spent within the month that it that it is, they, the funds are withdrawn. So let's say they are withdrawing two months worth of rent, um, then um, the money has to be um, paid, to, um, paid to the landlord or whomever within that um, month that it is withdrawn from the ABLE account. Um, <clears throat> legal fees, um, we see a lot of individuals who do have trusts or special needs trust and ABLE accounts. Um, they can use their investable account to pay for any legal fees um, if needed or other legal fees um, for whatever circumstances they might be experiencing. Um, so I'm giving a lot of examples, evidence of, of things that I've encountered. Um, one unique um, um, circumstance is we have one account owner who has an investable account and a special needs trust, and they have a certain amount um, transferred from their special needs trust into their investable account on a monthly or regular basis so that they can pay for their own cell phone bill. Um, so they just want to have that additional, that autonomy, that financial empowerment um, to be able to pay for some of their own bills on, on their own. Um, so they use um, the special needs trust and the investable account together. Um, so as long as the terms of the trust are set up so that it can allow for that transfer, then it's absolutely possible to have both working in that way. Um, we do encourage individuals to keep track of their expenses. I, um, keeping receipts is always advisable, um, but certainly keep track of the expenses from the ABLE account in, case, in the case of an audit. Now, I mentioned the tax advantages um, on, that uh, exist on ABLE accounts on top of um, um, the um, ability to save money and not risk losing benefits. The tax advantages, or that again, the money can grow and be withdrawn tax-free as long as it's used, as long as they're used um, for those qualified disability related expenses. But if the savings, if the money is used for um, what in the audit process would be considered a non-qualified expense, and I'll, I'll specify that the two entities that could potentially audit an ABLE account, and I'm really getting into the weeds on this. Um, so forgive me if it's, <laughs> if it's too confusing. Um, but it would be the IRS or the Social Security Administration. So if an individual is receiving Social Security benefits, supplemental security income, for example, then um, they could audit the account and make sure that um, the expenses are qualified. That, um, um, but the IRS certainly can also audit um, this type of savings and investment account. So that being said, when the savings are used for a non-qualified expense, then essentially the individual is going to have to pay 
taxes on any earnings portion of the withdrawal. So as I mentioned earlier, post-tax dollars fund the account. The money can grow by being invested and be withdrawn tax-free as long as the money is used for those qualified expenses. So if it's not used for the qualified expenses as determined through the course of an audit, then the earnings portion of the withdrawal would be treated as income and it would be taxed at the account owner's tax rate and subject to a 10% federal tax penalty with applicable any and any applicable state taxes. So a similar sort of tax penalty as to what exists on um, 529 college savings accounts for non-qualified expenses, but not exactly the same. Um, and then that retirement savings contributions credit, the savers credit is available to um, individuals who contribute their earned income from a job into their investable account and, um, and who are also not participating in an employer sponsored retirement program. So it's also known as the savers credit. And I encourage individuals to, if they are working and contributing um, earned income into their investable account to um, con contact a financial professional uh, provider and um, or advisor rather, and see if they might be eligible for that savers credit. I will mention, um, and I was talking to Kelly just a little bit about this prior to the start of the webinar that Indiana actually just, the state legislature actually um, recently passed a state tax credit for contributions into an Indiana ABLE account. So an investable Indiana account. So beginning taxable year 2024. So when you file your taxes in 2025, a state tax credit of 20% worth up to $500 will be available to any Indiana taxpayer who contributes into Investable Indiana. So it's a nice added state level um, um, benefit, so to speak, to contributing into yours or your loved one's Investable Indiana account. And um, I know it's not this year, but um, it's, in, it's on the horizon, so beginning uh, again, taxable year 2024 individuals will um, be able to take advantage for that when they file um, their taxes for 2024. And it's a tax credit, not a, a deduction. So that is money that goes directly back into your pocket. All right, so I'm going to throw a, a few numbers at you over the next couple slides. Um, and again, if it's don't try to try not to be overwhelmed by like drinking from a fire hose here. I'm I'm here after today and our plan is here to answer any questions or refresh um, your memory. And then of course, um, this webinar will be available after this evening for future reference. Um, so balance it. So let's talk about any impact on benefits. How much can be saved in the Investable Indiana account and how much can be contributed into the account? So if an individual is receiving SSI, they can save up to an aggregate total of $100,000. If their ABLE account balance ever goes over $100,000, then their monthly cash benefit um, from SSI is temporarily suspended. Um, they don't lose eligibility for SSI. Um, they do lose that monthly cash benefit if that, again, if that balance um, goes over $100,000. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. They do maintain Medicaid eligibility regardless of the account balance. So the possibility of Medicaid recapture after death of the account owner, um, this can be an area where some people have heard information about Medicaid payback, maybe they haven't, but to helpfully clear up any, or dispel, dispel any myths, this can only happen, Medicaid recapture can only happen after all outstanding qualified expenses from the Investable account and from the ABLE account. Um, are paid for. So if you think back to that list of qualified expenses, um, it's very broad, A, and B, that last bullet point on the list was funeral and burial expenses. So if the individual um, uses or the, the, their, um, the authorized individual, whomever is managing their estate after their passing, um, wants to use the funds in their investable account to pay for those funeral and burial expenses, that is possible. Um, and I will mention, so, so as you see there, Medicaid does not get quote unquote first dibs on those funds. They can only seek recapture under certain circumstances. This is, and I will say after all of those outstanding qualified expenses are paid for. Um, Indiana Medicaid has taken the position that they will not actively seek recapture of funds from Investable Indiana accounts unless they're federally required to do so. 
but under that federal requirement does exist um, certain Medicaid waiver Medicaid waiver services. So it's just important to keep um, to keep that in mind. And when I've worked with special needs planning and estate planning, their state attorneys, they um, their sort of advice that and this, again this is not intended to be construed as legal advice, but it's just a sort of anecdotal um, um, examples or evidence. Um, they they've mentioned just keeping an eye on the balance in the account and saving for what you think the expenses might be or have an idea of what, what will be um, utilized in terms of paying for the needs, the certain needs of, of you or your loved one. So Medicaid rec recapture does not occur in all circumstances. Um, all right, so the next few numbers I'm gonna throw at you are the annual contribution limit and the non-SSI savings, uh, we'll call it the non-SSI savings limit. So first and foremost, there's only one ABLE account allowed per owner, but anyone can contribute. With InvestAble Indiana, we have what is called the U-Gift feature. You may or may not be familiar with this if you know someone um, who has a 529 college choice um, um, savings account. Um, but the U-Gift feature is a unique online gifting platform. So think of it as kind of like a crowdsourcing or crowdfunding platform. Um, so if you have your child um, who has a birthday, holiday, special occasion coming up and they just don't need any more toys and they don't, uh, and you don't necessarily want to give them money directly, or you would just rather save it and put it aside for their future. Um, you can generate a unique code for their investable account and send that out to family members, friends, loved ones, um, whomever, and say, hey, in light of gifts this year, please consider gifting into our child's, our loved one's Investable account. Here's the UGIFT code um, and the link to the UGIFT platform. It's a secure online gifting platform. Um, so it's just nice if you're not able to save a significant amount throughout the year. Um, and again, those it, coming in the near future, as long as those contributors are um, taxpayers in the state of Indiana, they will be able to take, care, take advantage of that um, state tax credit as well. <clears throat> so. Presently, the annual contribution limit from all combined sources is $16,000. This adjusts periodically for inflation. So next year, and, and is also lim mirrored off of the federal gift tax exclusion limit. So beginning next year in 2023, the annual contribution limit for ABLE accounts will be $17,000. But presently for 2022, the year of 2022, the annual contribution limit is $16,000. Um, the aggregate savings limit, so this is the savings limit for individuals who are not receiving SSI, that savings limit is $450,000. So with that annual contribution limit being where it is, um, it's of course going to take some time to get up to that um, higher savings threshold, that total aggregate balance. Um, but it is, it is nice that um, certainly these types of accounts exist and allow for significant savings. Um, rollovers from 529 savings accounts, college savings accounts into ABLE accounts are allowed. I just always encourage individuals who are rolling those funds over from a 529 program to check with that program and their tax advisor um, to see if there are any specific tax um, implications in um, engaging in that rollover. Um, you can also roll over an ABLE account from one, from one ABLE account to another ABLE account. Um, as long as, um, like I said, only you can only have one account. Um, but if, if say you opened an enable account in another state and you wanted to roll it over into Indiana's um, Investable Indiana, you can do that. Just contact the plan and we can help get that started for you. And able to work allows for individuals who work um, and are not participating in an employer-sponsored retirement program to contribute above and beyond the annual contribution limit that is presently set at $16,000 up to the federal poverty level. So just allows for um, quite a bit more of savings um, into an individual's able investable account who, um, who would like to save additional um, amounts from their earnings. Um, and the additional amounts that they can save over that 16, that presently $16,000 annual contribution limit is the lesser of either the, um, their annual um, gross income or the federal, federal poverty limit. So quite a bit um, more, I think it's over $24,000 that could, um, I'm doing my math correctly, <laughs> that could be saved in the um, ABLE account. So 
We understand investing can be confusing. We've tried to make it as easy as possible, especially considering we're working with a population that has historically not been able to save or invest much, if not at all. Um, but we also recognize the unique and broad needs of our, um, of our constituency, of our savers. Um, so we do have six investment options that range from more aggressive options to more conservative options. Um, we also have a checking option that comes with a debit card so that that option can be used a little more transactionally if an individual would like. And so on this slide, it just gives you kind of a high level overview of what those investment options look like. Um, when, if you go to our website after today um, and take a look at the different savings and investment options, there is a button on there that says, what type of investor are you? That, can that kind of gives you a, a few different scenarios as to what type of um, savings or investment options um, you or your loved one might be um, best suited for, but it, it is again, not intended to be um, construed as um, tax or, or tax advice or financial advice. Um, just some examples, because we've noticed that, um, that a little bit of extra guidance is helpful to our savers. Um, so they are a mixture, these savings and investment options are a mix, mixture primarily of mutual funds and ETFs. So relatively low risk investment options. Um, the checking option is 100% cash based and um, FDIC insured. Um, and our partner with the checking option is Fifth Third Bank. With that being said, um, an individual does not go to a bank or financial institution to open an investable account. Um, they, I'll give you all the information here at the end of the presentation. It's actually all, can all be done online um, through the program directly. So federal requirement only allows two allocation changes amongst those investment options per year. We have sim simplified that by offering systematic exchanges and you cannot move money freely from the investment accounts to the checking option um, without the systematic exchanges. Um, but you can take a withdrawal from any investment option at any time. So I mentioned with the checking option, it comes with a debit card. So certainly um, you could take that debit card to the grocery store, to the pharmacy to pay for whatever your expenses, your or your loved one's expenses might be. Um, if taking a withdrawal from one of the investment options, you can simply go online and initiate that transfer by wire, uh, bank transfer. Um, you can even directly um, make payments to say if it's a um, um, uh, medical provider or, or therapy provider, that sort of thing. You can, you can make payments, I should say, directly to a third party if you would like to do that from, from the, um, as part of the withdrawal process. Um, or you can just give us a call and we can process that um, and the, the withdrawal can be processed easily. So it's your money, you have direct access to and control over it. Yours or your loved ones, I should say. So you do have that direct access to and control over it. It's not like a special needs trust that you have to get approval for um, the withdrawals or disbursements. Um, with it being a savings and investment option, there are certain fees associated with it, but they're, they're pretty low and actually com very competitive amongst um, other ABLE um, savings programs in the US. Um, the minimum to open an account is $25. Um, the annual asset-based fees on those investment options ranges from 0.30 to 0.33%. These fees are actually just lowered within the past few months. Um, and then the um, account maintenance fee is either $59 a year or $34 a year. To get that significant reduction from $59 per year to $34 per year, um, just enroll in e-delivery, so electronic delivery, of statements and notifications and um, the account owner can experience that um, reduction in that account maintenance fee. And I will mention that account maintenance fee is, it's broken into smaller installments throughout the year. So it's taken out quarterly. So um, it's not $59 or $39, $34 um, withdrawn all at once. It's broken up into smaller quarterly installments. The checking option is $2 a month if utilizing that option. But this fee can also be waived if the account maintains an average daily balance of over $250, or again, if you receive electronic um, statement delivery through that option. And we are approaching the end of my slides now. Um, I'm going to give you some information on how to enroll, um, kind of give you a high, high level overview of what the enrollment process looks like. Um, I'm not going to go too deep into it. 
Um, but if you do get to the point where you or your loved one is ready to open the account and you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to our client services team. They do this every day. That's what they are there for to help answer these questions. Um, they can see everything from the back end, so, so to speak, the back end, the op uh, operations of the system and, and that sort of thing to see if um, something was done incorrectly in the enrollment process, that sort of thing. So I always encourage folks to reach out to our client services team when there's enrollment questions. I'm happy to be a resource as well, more than happy to be a resource as well. Um, but I am a person, a staff of one, and they have a whole team there um, ready and able to help you all. But our website, enrollment and enrollment is all done, can all be done online. And there's a lot of information available on our website. And our website is in.savewithable.com. To open an account, it's basically three steps. We always encourage folks to, look, to take a look at the program disclosure statement. Um, I recognize it's a lengthy document, has a lot of information on there, but it is easily, um, you can in, do an easy search and find to jump to certain sections of the document if you would like to just um, look at certain parts of that. Um, and then in the enrollment process, like one of the first, you're gonna go to our website and you're ready to say you're ready to start enrolling. There will be a button that says start saving, you click on start saving. It will ask you um, to either enter your account information, um, so personal identifying information, name and, name and account number, I think it is. Um, but if you don't have an account already, you just um, start, you just um, select the option to um, open a new account or enroll. And it will first ask, um, one of the first questions asked will be, who is the individual opening this account? Is it the eligible individual or is it an authorized individual? And if you're an authorized individual, where on the hierarchy, um, what type of individual are you? Um, if it's someone with a power of attorney enrolling on behalf of an eligible individual, we will, we will ask that they um, either provide or um, upload that authorizing doc, uh, power of attorney documentation. Um, but for other types of authorized individuals, we do not collect um, any sort of supporting documentation. Um, after you answer those questions as to who is opening this account, it will ask you to input certain personal um, identifying information, such as a street address, social security or taxpayer ID number, a birth date. And in the enrollment process, you can even input um, and link a personal bank account number to either pre-schedule contributions from a personal checking or savings account, or make that initial contribution of 25 or more dollars. So again, our website is in.savewithable.com. Make sure you have all of the um, information on hand when ready, when ready to enroll. If for some reason you don't complete the enrollment process in um, that first sitting, it takes about 15 or 20 minutes to complete the process. But if you don't complete the enrollment in that sitting, um, you have up to, I think it is 60 days to come back and complete that. If um, you go past 60 days, the account automatically gets closed. It's just a safety feature um, to protect um, individuals who had started that process. But if it does get closed, if it goes past 60 days, you can go back in and restart the process, process at any time. Um, so again, make sure um, you're aware of who is um, the type of individual opening the account. And if you're going to self-certify, make sure that you have that qualifying that disability diagnosis. And then in the enrollment process, you'll be walked through the different savings and investment options. It will ask you um, by percentage, um, it'll outline um, or list the different savings and investment options and ask you to input a percentage of your contributions, um, how, how you want your, your contributions allocated amongst those options. So if you want 50% say in the conservative option and 50% um, allocated into the checking option, um, you can do that. And then we always encourage individuals to um, have their family and friends contribute into their Investable account or their loved one's Investable account to help them save for their future needs. This is just important legal information that I'm required to um, provide, just stating I, I'm not authorized to give tax or legal advice. Our, our, um, pardon me, our program manager is a census who actually oversees um, our college savings accounts, our program in the state, so they are trusted provider in this space. And I'll pause here um, for those who are present or if um, in, in listening to this, pro this webinar in the future, if any of these um, 
particular FAQs jump out at you. I've tried to touch on them all to, in some regard um, in the presentation. Um, but if there's one that I specifically didn't, um, let me know. Um, that last bullet point, is there a residency requirement for Investable Indiana? No, there is not. Um, an individual can live in the state and move out of state and keep their Investable Indiana account. Um, an individual can live out of state and, um, and, and utilize Investable Indiana. I just always encourage folks to consider their home state's ABLE program in case there is um, a state tax um, benefit for um, utilizing that account. And this is the last slide of my presentation. Um, it's our website listed in.savewithable.com. You can go online again to learn more information, enroll or request, um, request more information about the program. Um, our client services team is available by email at in.clientservice at savewithable.com or by phone Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. at 888-609-3457. Thank you so much. Amy, this is great, great information. Thank you so much for doing this. Um, Kelly, do you have any other questions? Um, okay, so if I have a kiddo that I start with a 529 account, you said you can roll that over into a 529A account. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. I just, I have an eight-year-old son, so we're not quite sure where life is going to lead us. And okay. so just trying to plan for the future, but wanting to make sure that we're investing that appropriately. And, um, so that was my, my one question. And then, um, when can, what, is there an age limit at when money can be withdrawn from the account? Like, is there a time when that's a great question and, and sound knowing that you are familiar with five, two nines, because there are certain Certain, certain rules surrounding those accounts. With ABLE, no, you can make a withdrawal at any point in time. And I will mention in regards to, um, you know, lightly connected to your circumstance or in regards to your circumstances that we have, we've seen a lot of individuals and I'm not trying to influence your opinion at all. I'm just giving you examples of what we've seen. Yeah. Um, individuals who have a loved one, have a child with um, a diagnosis, um, oftentimes autism that you're, you're like, I'm not sure if they're going to go to college. I'm not sure if we're going to use those dollars for, from their 529 for those vocational expenses or for those post-secondary education expenses. If you think back to that list of qualified expenses, education is on there and then some. So we see a lot of individuals who started saving in a 529 that decide to roll it over into an investable account because there is a broader range of qualified expenses. And if you have a child with autism, they would be eligible to have an investable account. Um, with that being said, there are different, um, I mean, there's different fees between the two programs. There's other things that of course you, you should consider, um, but just again, anecdotally um, or circum, you know, circumstantial um, experiences that, we, that we've seen with account owners, they were just like, we just felt that it would fit our loved one's needs, but certainly consult your tax professional. Um, there's, there's lots of other things to consider other than um, the list of qualified expenses, but no, great questions. You can withdraw it at any point in time. So if you contribute, if you roll over $5,000 from their 529 into the ABLE account, or if you just, if you have the 529 and the ABLE account um, and, and you, I don't know where I was going with that. <laughs> Oh no, so if you roll, roll that over, um, you could withdraw it all in the next next few months, um, you know, if you needed to for whatever expenses that might come up, so. So uh, I'm, also a, I'm also a special ed teacher. Um, so I teach developmental preschool. And so I'm um, trying to gather some info for our families in our program with that as well. So this is something that even parents with really young kids can utilize and access for saving purposes and, and access kind of immediately for some therapy options. Is that what I'm hearing? Absolutely. So they could start saving in this account if they wanted to put some money aside to save for those additional therapy options. Okay. And okay. Um, Kelly, I'm not sure if you have the PDF of our plan brochure, but I will share that with you after today as well, along with the slides. Um, and well, Kelly, Kelly, sorry, Kelly, <laughs> Kelly, know, Higgins, right? Kelly Blakely. Um, <laughs> I, I'm happy to, I will, I'll 
speak out my, and, and I'll put it into the chat as well, my contact, um, my email. Um, if you have a group of special ed teachers, I do a lot of transition fairs okay. and I'm present at a lot of transition fairs throughout the year, specifically, as you likely know, at the end of the school year, when we have those young adults transitioning out of high school or out of their um, early education, um, I'm happy to present as well to those groups or, or provide any information that's needed, but I'll Great. go ahead and put my contact information in there. You can send them my way. Or again, like I said, I'm a, st a staff of one. I try to be as responsive as I can be to inquiries, but if you ever, um, if you're hit, if I'm out of the office or whatever, just reach out to our client services team. And if it's something that they can't address, then they pass it on to me. Thank you. You're welcome. Those are great questions. Thank you. Um, yeah, I will definitely be uh, sending um, Amy's information to those who registered along with a recording and any information that Amy sends me, um, PDF wise and all her resources, I will be sending that to everybody as well. I also have um, a special needs trust and ABLE comparison chart that I will share with mm. you because I find that to be super helpful and it's, it goes in, into some pretty good detail, not too much deep detail, but some good detail. That's great. I'll send over my slides, that comparison chart and the PDF of the brochure. Perfect. All right, Amy, thank you so much for this information. It's wonderful. And this is really good um, things that parents need to know to help their kids with autism and other disabilities. Absolutely. Well, thank you again for having me and thank you both for being here. All right, thanks. You're welcome. Have a good evening, bye.